down. I pronounce this pretty Persian, yeah. Uh, he's an attorney, uh, an Rechtsanwalt, is that called in, in, in Dutch. And he works for the Gesellschaft für Freiheitsrechte in Berlin, if I'm right. Good. Give them a welcome applause, please. Um, it's early in the morning, but we're going to kick back here. Early in the morning. Only at the Congress you can call 12.30 early in the morning, but it is. And... Um, well, if you've ever sat on a plane and wondered uh, what the person three rows behind you is eating, whether uh, they're flying alone, whether they have uh, checked in their luggage or only hand luggage, and what visa they were using when they were buying their plane ticket, then you're probably um, a police officer or should join the national police of any EU member state because that is exactly what uh, national police is in Germany and Austria and other European um, member, state, Euro member states of the European <laughs> Union can do thanks to the PNR directive which is the topic of today's talk and uh, we are going to talk and explain to you what the PNR directive and the laws transpos transposing it into national law are all about why this is problematic and what uh, we can do and when, what we are actually doing against it. Uh, in order to stop it. And uh, Walter will, will start off with a few info. Yeah, hello. Um, so firstly, I would like to introduce you into Epicenter Works because we have already a history on bringing down data retention laws. So probably you know us from our fight uh, against uh, data retention in Europe when we still were called Akaforat Österreich. I'm working for Epicenter Works on a voluntary basis and uh, I would like to mention my colleague Angelika Adensamer, who did the main work on this for Epicenter Works, but uh, she cannot be at Congress this year. So, flight data. It is said, I've heard that uh, at any given point in time, one million people are on a, bl on a plane in the skies flying around the globe, as you can see here. And um, today, uh, although in times of resource exhaustion, we should talk about that anyway, I'm convinced. Today we are talking about a data protection issue about it, a big one. And we are talking about passenger name records. So what is a passenger name record anyway? A passenger name record, uh, as you can see here, is a data set compiled of uh, 19 uh, different uh, data fields, so you can get about up to 60 different data points on one single passenger on one single flight. So for instance, you have data in there, like the first and second name, address, but also other things, uh, metadata, more important things, like uh, the means of uh, payment you made, the point in time when you booked the flight, and things like that. And a, sp a specific problem about it is that there is also a free text field, so airline employees can enter uh, data there, uh, which we cannot control. And uh, altogether, we have a quite big data set of each passenger on each flight. So this is common in the airline industry, but in 2016, the PNR Directive came about. So what is the PNR Directive? It is a piece of European legislation which was enacted in April 2016. And when we have European legislation, it's important to mention that it doesn't come out of the blue, out of Brussels but it is enacted together uh, with, from the Commission, the European, Parla European Parliament, and the Council. And the Council are the, the governments of our member states. So we have to keep in mind that member states' governments have a big say when uh, things like this are enacted. And it is a directive, and that means that every single member state has to transpose the content of the directive into its national law. And this had to be done until the 25th May of 2018. 
this was the transposition deadline and for instance Austria and Germany uh, made laws to transpose that into their national law. So what had uh, they to enact? They had to enact laws prescribing that all airlines have to transfer data of all passengers, all passenger name records of every flight and they have to be pushed to a national police database. So unlike the telecom data retention I already mentioned, the data is not kept uh, where, it, uh, where, where it is created, but it has to be pushed from the private sector, from the airlines to police database, databases. And um, the data retention directive prescribes that every flight leaving or entering the European Union must be covered by that, but in addition every single member state also covered flights within the EU. So you have, we have the full take now. Flights within the EU as well as flights leaving or entering the EU. And every single record of every single passenger of every single flight is in a police database and will be compared with existing databases, for instance, of known criminals or uh, of uh, stolen passports and the like, and they try to find uh, matches there. And what they are also going to do is matching with predetermined criteria. So they will come up with flight patterns of known perpetrators, for instance, when they book their flight and so on. They uh, will algorithmically uh, try to find patterns there and then they will compare your flight passenger name records with that data and if you have a similar behavior than a previous perpetrator, a previous criminal for instance, then you are already under suspicion. And this data in these databases are stored for five years and can be further used by different law enforcement agencies, so the data is not only compared and then deleted again, the storage time is five years and uh, they do something called depersonalization about six months after uh, the data was created, but uh, this is not in any way an anonymization, but they just remove some data and it can easily be uh, identified again. So the, uh, the person the data belongs to can easily be identified for the whole period of five years. So you probably asked yourself already, first, is this effective? Well, uh, this runs already since last year, so we have some data. First, I will present to you the data from Austria. In Austria, uh, we found out that um, Already until the 30th of September 2019, almost 24 passenger name records were forwarded to the passenger name unit at the Bundeskriminalamt. And uh, 11,900,000 different people were subject to that. And of, the, of these almost 24 million passenger name records, the algorithms, the checking against databases, uh, already brought up 190,000 matches. So every single match, every single uh, output the algorithm has must be checked by a human employee. So we have uh, sitting there people who have to check, even this is not, on, not even the data of a year, and they have to check 190,000 matches. And only 280 of them are actual hits. So if a person checks what the algorithm outputs there, then only in 0.15% uh, of the cases, uh, the policewoman or policeman come to the conclusion, yeah, this is actually relevant for us. And if you do the math, uh, this means that only 0.001% of all the 24 million passenger name data, your data which is checked, actually leads to a hit. And we don't even know how many actual 
um, false positives remain in these 220. This is only what the police will inspect uh, afterwards. So we have uh, no numbers or results if they had actual investigative results on that. But what we can say is that there are 21 employees, qualified employees, working in the passenger name, passenger information unit, and this costs almost 2 million euros per year, uh, and uh, only for checking the data in the small country of Austria. And Bishan now will present you the data in German. The, number, the data of the big neighbor, because you said small country. <laughs> Austria. Yeah. In Germany, the, the numbers are surprisingly similar. Uh, we also had, uh, have numbers up until mid of August 2019, and we have had uh, almost 32 million uh, passenger name records checked, uh, which generated automatic results of uh, matches of uh, about 240,000, which then were checked by 40 uh, police officers. And um, um, there remained only 910 actual hits, so the fail rate was 99.6%, and only 0.003% of all PNRs checked led to actual hits. And even of that number, uh, just as in Austria, we are not sure how many false positives remain. We know that there were considerably uh, a considerable amount of false positives. We estimate them to be in the hundreds, but the law enforcement uh, did not specify um, what actually, uh, how many false positives remained, even among the 910. And one of the results we know is that it led to 57 arrests. We don't know for which crimes. We don't know whether these people actually committed a crime, whether they were suspected um, uh, for a crime, whether they were just on a watch list. But 57 arrests, assuming this is, uh, these were legitimate, this means that 0.0002% of all PNRs checked led to an arrest. And if you uh, try to, to um, transpose this to other situations in life, uh, you could go to a, to a market, to, to some... Uh, to some festival or whatnot and just ask randomly people and you would probably have with a similar probability um, an arrest in the end, at the end of the day. So if this holds, if this whole PNR processing holds, if this effectiveness is the standard that we are um, happy with, then you can easily uh, take this to all other um, uh, sorts of uh, way, walks of life and this is, uh, to, in our opinion, a big problem. Uh, because it will lead to a digital surveillance state, uh, which is, uh, has come quite near with these new tools that the PNI directive um, provide. Uh, what we've now just shown are the, the automatic is the, the, the checks against databases. That was the one thing that the PNI directive provides for. The other one is the checking against predetermined criteria, and this is where the voodoo kind of starts, because the idea that you can um, merely from uh, the data that uh, is in the PNR, in your passenger name record, uh, derive whether you are suspicious or dangerous even, um, is at least in our opinion uh, pretty much voodoo, and it, it has uh, serious consequences, and it might uh, lead to automatic profiling affecting hundreds of millions of people, possibly, because everybody is checked when they, and when they use a plane, every PNR record is checked against these automatic, uh, against these predetermined criteria, and not just for crimes such as terrorism or organized crime, where you could maybe make a case that uh, there, there exists such a thing as a pattern of movements where you can identify a terrorist suspect, but it is also used uh, for crimes such as fraud um, or forgery or uh, cybercrime, where I would argue you cannot find a typical cyber criminal's flights pattern, flight patterns. It's just not possible. And uh, so, uh, but, but the PNR directive itself is only the one thing. We are fighting this for reasons that go way beyond the PNR processing, so the, the processing of PNR flight data because um, it may set a dangerous precedent for other mass surveillance. Already now, PNR processing is being discussed for buses that cross borders, for ships and trains, and there are some countries such as Belgium that have already enacted um, the very much. And why stop there, might a police officer argue? Why not include rental cars that cross borders? Why not at some point include private cars that cross borders? Why not get away with that requirement of crossing borders? Why not have everybody checked all the time, maybe via their mobile phones? So when we give way to this sort of data processing uh, with such a low threshold of effectiveness, we open the door for all sorts of 
um, of uh, activity that, that, at least from our point of view, is illegal. And the question you were maybe asking yourself, or maybe not, is this legal? Uh, we are convinced it is not, and uh, luckily, we could rely on uh, an, a legal opinion that the European Court of Justice, ECJ, has rendered uh, two and a half years ago. And there is one PNR agreement in place between the EU and the USA, which has not been challenged yet. Um, and another agreement was supposed to uh, be no or was negotiated between the EU Commission and Canada. And the EU Parliament then presented the question to the ECJ whether this um, agreement would be violating fundamental rights of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. And the ECJ concluded uh, that it would in the form that it, uh, it was proposed to it, um, breach Article 7 and 8 of that charter. So Article 7 is the right to privacy, and Article 8 is the right to have your data protected, your personal data protected. And we are, of course, relying heavily on that, on the arguments that the, that the court developed and uh, developing them even further, because, as you can imagine, the PNR, um, the agreement with Canada and the PNR directive are quite similar. So what are these arguments that we are um, bringing up. Uh, we've shown already that uh, the effectiveness is highly doubtful, and this leads us to concluding that the PNR directive is disproportionate, so it violates human uh, the fundamental rights for several reasons. One being uh, a point that we've both raised already, that PNR processing indiscriminately affects all passengers. And this is a very important point because it, makes, uh, it shows the difference between PNR processing uh, under the PNR directive and what was formerly uh, the, the data retention of telecommunications data. Because the latter would require a, a, a specific case, something must have, must have had happened in order for the uh, law enforcement to ask for the telecommunications data of um, a telecommunications provider. But um, our PNR data for, on flights is checked all the time, always, against databases and, even more importantly, the predetermined criteria, which we, of course, do not know nothing about. And this brings with it, especially the last point, the, the predetermined criteria, a high risk of false accusations. We've already seen that 99.6% of database matching, automatic database matching, is wrongful. And imagine how, how much higher the number would be um, with, um, with uh, checking against predetermined criteria. And um, that, the, the reason why we expect many false accusations, false positives, is the so-called base rate fallacy, which basically says that when you're looking for a very small amount of people in a large data set, and you have a significant fail rate, you're very likely to produce more false positives, maybe many more false positives than true positives, so actual suspects, or not suspects, but actual terrorists. Um, so, for instance, when you're, if you're checking 100 million flight passengers and you're looking for 100 terrorists and you have even a fail rate of 0.1%, not the 99.6 that we're talking about now, but even just 0.1%, this would render, this would, this would render 100,000 flight passengers uh, subject to, to, uh, to being suspected terrorists. So you would have 100,000 false positives, 100 terrorists that, let's assume, all of them, so they, they have a, a positive um, a success rate of 100% in identifying positively uh, as a terrorist suspect, then you will have 100,000 um, false um, positives, 100 people that are correctly um, suspected, but everybody, of course, will be treated the same. And um, what I've listed here are just the obvious things, uh, stigmatization at the airport by interrogation, searches of um, luggage of person, people, um, arrests, missing flights, and um, depending on the country you're in, you, you may be in much more trouble after that. A second point is that the data is being stored way too long. As uh, what has already mentioned, five years. Why do you need five years worth of data to check a, a database entry or against predetermined criteria? Of course, you don't need it for that, because you could do that uh, immediately after a person uh, has boarded. You can perform the check, and then you could get rid of the data uh, deleted after it's been used. The reason why they're storing it so long is that law enforcement and intelligence agencies have an interest that goes beyond that checking after boarding. They want to keep the data and check it in future criminal investigations, in future um, looking into a person, what, where they've traveled, and so on and so forth. 
uh, but that has nothing to do with the original purpose of uh, PNR, the PNR directive. And what at least everybody here will know, all data storing, so data storing uh, is in itself a problem, it's a, in itself a violation of, of uh, fundamental rights when there's no legitimate reason to do so, but also all data storing puts the data stored at risk, and uh, as we've mentioned already, there's um, payment uh, data, especially there's other, other sensitive data with whom you've traveled, whether you've traveled uh, with light luggage or not, where you have gone to, um, via which um, place, and so on and so forth. Another point which is a bit more complicated is that the directive does not sufficiently differentiate between crimes where automatic profiling could make sense and others. So as I've, I've said, there may be a, a point in saying that the typical terrorist would fly from A to B via C um, without checking in luggage, using this or that tourist um, office, and so on and so forth. So maybe just assume that this is the case. Um, this, uh, no one can, can tell me that there's a typical flight pattern of a fraudster where you could ask some, uh, define which way a, a fraudster typically flies and identify such a person. So what the directive would have needed to do if they wanted, had wanted to check against predetermined criteria would have been to identify for which crimes exactly and only for these you can use such a, 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 a voodoo, a, a miracle weapon. And uh, finally, these, this is, these are not the only arguments, but the more, most important ones. We expect that the false positives especially will lead to discrimination is, against minorities. Um, one example that the German National Police, the Bundeskriminalamt, has given us for a predetermined criteria are um, young men flying from um, airports from the south of Turkey to a major European city. So they're thinking about uh, former IS fighters, IS terrorists, and as you can easily imagine, uh, what kind of people will be sitting um, in, in a, on a plane uh, that's coming from the south of Turkey to Germany or to an, any other European country. Of course, this will affect, um, disproportionately affect minorities. And um, it is already now highly intransparent uh, what, how these, um, these predetermined criteria are um, developed. And imagine a near future where law enforcement will uh, naturally try to involve artificial intelligence in finding patterns in the raw data of um, flight movements of PNR, of the treasure they are now hoarding with a five-year worth of data. And um, at the latest, at that point in time, it will be impossible for us to understand why um, a certain criterion was defined and how, how to challenge it when you're in the position to be arrested at the airport, for instance. So what can we do? And that's where we come in, the, the two organizations that, that we are. We are no um, typical um, advocacy organizations, but we do strategic litigation. Because unfortunately, no advocacy uh, worked on the PNR directive. It came into force uh, pretty much as the um, as national law enforcement uh, wanted uh, it to be. And uh, so there's one instance, one authority at, uh, that in, in, in Europe, in Germany, in Europe, the European Union, the courts, which can, which can ideally um, dismiss of the reasons, of the motivations of law enforcement to have such a directive uh, enforced and can try to objectively assess whether this is actually legal and should um, remain in force, stay in force or not. And uh, we did this through litigation both in Germany and in Austria, and both are having the same goal, which is to present to the European Court of Justice the question whether the PNI directive and any uh, national law that is transposing the PNI directive is uh, in violation of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Why do we have to go? Why is the ECJ important? Because when you have a national law that um, directly transposes a European law, um, a directive, uh, then only the ECJ can declare such a law void. There's no way for, for instance, in Germany, the Federal Constitutional Court, the Bundesverfassungsgericht, to, to say that um, this law should not be applied any longer. Um, this question must be presented to the ECJ. So how could we get to the ECJ? This actually was a process that took us quite a bit of time. Um, it's been two years in the making. A year ago, we launched six um, different complaints 
of six, six different plaintiffs that are flying um, all over Europe, that we booked flights for them, that uh, led them to European member states, the European Union member states, and to um, states outside of the European Union. And we um, sent the, co the complaints to three different courts. Uh, one, uh, two, two complaints were directed against the German national police and went to the administrative court in Wiesbaden. And four others were directed against the airplane, air, airlines. So we tried to diversify as much as possible in order to find a judge uh, that would um, agree with us that this is problematic and this needs checking. And uh, we are optimistic that uh, either the court in Wiesbaden or the court in Cologne will soon present uh, these very questions to the court whether um, the German transposition law and the PNR directive itself are violating fundamental rights of the European, uh, of the chart of the European Union. So, as Bijan already mentioned, our aim is to bring our case as quick as possible to the European Court of Justice. So we had different options and in Austria we went a third way. We brought a case before the Austrian Data Protection Authority against uh, the Fluggastdatenzentralstelle im Bundeskriminalamt, so the passenger name unit. And uh, we, we brought several different cases and we also found out uh, different smaller things which we are on, but uh, the main thing is that uh, this case already went as planned to the uh, Bundesverwaltungsgericht, so the, the Federal Administrative Court in Austria, and um, from there we hope that is also soon forwarded to the European Court of Justice. And uh, in, theoretically it uh, would be enough if one case uh, uh, hits uh, the European Court of Justice, but practically it's of course very important to have different strategies uh, because there are uh, different uh, speeds uh, and, and so on. So uh, that's why we also should mention another case, the, the Belgian case. So this uh, Belgian uh, human rights organization, they also uh, brought a case before a Belgian court in this case, it was directly the Belgian Constitutional Court. So uh, they uh, had a direct way to the Constitutional Court, uh, unlike our cases in Austria where this, or in Germany where this was not possible. And therefore, uh, the Belgian Constitutional Court already referred the EC, uh, the, this case to the European Court of Justice. And uh, we are hoping that uh, our case will be soon, or cases, or at least some of them will soon be joined uh, with this case uh, at the European Court of Justice and then decided uh, together. So, to sum up, we have actually a very infringing piece of legislation, the PNR Directive, PNR uh, processing as Bijan uh, explained to us in more detail is extremely intrusive in all flight passengers fundamental rights it violates fundamental rights especially because it is already in it is also ineffective and disproportionate so uh, we, we heard about uh, these different things the base rate fallacy that it is ineffective and disproportionate because it is not really possible to find specific suspects in such amount of data with, without having a lot, a real lot of false positives. So uh, other arguments are that it is data retention in the first place, so also already the re retention of the data of uh, people like you and me uh, is uh, a big problem and, and unlawful and uh, this general suspicion it leads to. So everybody becomes uh, a suspect and can become practically a suspect, can uh, get problems practically uh, from that le legislation without uh, being uh, a criminal. And uh, yeah, we have strong arguments as we showed you already the case of uh, the Canada uh, PNR directive, the PNR um, agreement with Canada is very similar in practice to the PNR directive. So the arguments 
already held uh, before the European Court of Justice. So actually, it's a shame that this was not stopped earlier, and civil rights organizations, uh, as we are, uh, have to do that. And uh, uh, that's what we do. And, and that's also why uh, we depend on donations. So uh, that's also important to stress that uh, our work, uh, people having people full employed to do things like that, costs some money. And uh, that's where you can find us. So we have a campaign website, nopnr.eu in, in German and English. And uh, you can find us, of course, on our website and uh, both websites and uh, find ways how to join us, how to support us. And also, still today, you can meet us at our assembly in the CCL building, the About Freedom Assembly, where both uh, the Gesellschaft für Freiheitsrechte and Epicenter Works have their desk, and you can ask uh, all the questions. But uh, first, ask all your questions now. Thank you. Thank you, Walter and Bijan, for this uh, very clarifying uh, statements. Um, I suppose there are quite some questions here in the audience, um, only I'm looking at someone who's grabbing a microphone now. Um, so, ah, I see the signal angel. Yes. The mic is not on. Can someone help him? Signal angel needs a mic. No. Yes. It's almost there. Brains are working. Hello, hello. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Is there a cheap method to spam false entries, for example, by booking flight under a false name and then cancelling the flight? Um, well, I think it's, it's difficult to... I, I, I didn't get the very first words. Sorry. Yeah, the very first one was, is there a cheap method to spam, to spam false entries? Okay. Yeah, theoretically, I, I don't think that anything could speak against that. Yeah. But um, the problem is that you would need to cancel very late because um, I think the first time they push the data, the airlines are pushing the data to the national police is 48 hours before, the, before boarding. So that might come, become a bit expensive. I would want to make a general remark also on that. Of course, uh, here, uh, especially here, uh, thoughts like that, how to hack the system, uh, are very important and can help. But our general approach is uh, to take legal action to protect all people at the same way and not only those who, who uh, are able to protect themselves or, or hack the system or, or whatever. So uh, that's the reason why we both uh, go this general way uh, to bring that down uh, completely. An other question here? Yes, sorry, sir. Yes, um, please. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Um, what do you expect as a, a result of your litigation if you are successful in court? Um, will, uh, do you expect the courts to strike down the directive entirely or do you expect another, uh, lit, uh, another legislative process to do the same thing again or to fix, quote unquote, the, the directive uh, in, in very small ways just to uh, to drag out this battle and continue the practice, what do you think the effects will be? Um, well, we think that the, the European Court of Justice, if it follows our, argument, our reasoning, it, should, it will strike down the PNR directive entirely because the way it is set up is fundamentally not in, um, in accordance with what it earlier ruled so far, unless it will change its, its entire history of ruling on data retention and so on and so forth. Um, but of course, we will expect uh, the um, member states to push for another legislation that may be similar, but not the exact same thing. So I, am, I can imagine something of, a, of the sort of data retention or telecommunications, as it were, um, with uh, airlines retaining the data and keeping it for a shorter period of time and only giving it out um, when there is a specific re request with, um, where there is a specific reason for law enforcement to ask for the data. I could imagine such a thing coming up again and then we would need to check whether this is illegal or not and, and um, maybe go through the whole procedure as well. But it's, uh, it would be an immense um, success if the PNR directive as it stands would be void. 
declared void. Thank you. Someone else has a question. I see a person here. Yeah. Microphone one, please. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you had the argument that uh, there are a lot of false positives when they check the PNR data. Um, do we have any information how long it takes for them to react on the PNR data if they get a positive hit? So maybe they only react after the person has landed and already uh, is in the country. Um, they claim that they can act immediately, but we can't know that for sure. So the, the fact that they had 57 arrests at the airports signals that at least it, in some respect this is true, but we cannot know for sure how much, how, how quickly they, they, they can react. And um, keep in mind, this is only um, the start. So, so far in Germany, or up until the point where this, the data that I presented for Germany um, came about, there were only nine airlines, I think, that were linked to the system. So expect there to be much more data coming in. And once they start with a predetermined criteria thing, um, this will multiply probably um, even. So I cannot imagine, unless they, 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 send, they, they have this new um, thing with, with hundreds of people involved, uh, that they can act immediately in each and every case. Yeah, thank you. There is a question again on the internet. Yes. Yes, how come you haven't tried voiding the local add one provisions, that is PNR for intra EU flights, that is most likely against Schengen provisions? Um, we have addressed that as well. We have picked uh, intra EU flights also. We've not just picked uh, flights that go um, extra EU, but. Um, uh, we've also made the point about the um, the violation of uh, Schengen criteria, but that is not so much uh, that is not the focus of our argument because there are, in our opinion, much stronger ones. Because uh, with Schengen, you would need to argue that it's practically impossible to to enter the country without uh, being held up, and you're not being held up in in a physical uh, form, at least not. Um, in, in, in general, generally, and so this argument is a bit more difficult than having a, an actual uh, border checking of people. Um, but but we're making this point, of course, and uh, but we rely on other points that we think is, are stronger. Okay, please, microphone number one, please. Um, is there also data being collected on flights inside a country? So, for example, from Munich to Berlin. Not yet, not under the directive, and theoretically, of course, uh, the German um, legislator or any other legislator could decide to include that as well, but uh, not so far. Number two, please, the microphone. Yeah, I was wondering how much uh, false negatives are in there. Do you know that? Like, are these big databases, if I don't act like a normal terrorist or something, then I... We don't, we don't know, unfortunately, not yet. Um, and I think it would be very interesting, especially for the predetermined criteria, to see how many they miss. Um, but, yeah, no, not, nothing yet. Yeah, and there is no undo button, I, I think. No? no? No undo. That's always the thing that, I, that I'm worried about, you know. Then you have an announcement about, for instance, data that go out. And then you can't have an undo, so what do we do then? It's always up new. Uh, yeah, you can keep this for five years now, but uh, who says it's there for five years and what kind of interpretation you get out of it for five years? after five years. And you can't know in which uh, database you will be transferred in the meantime, because law enforcement can ask the data of that very data set, for, for that data and the PNR data set, and put it in another data set, because they have whatever reason the, to do so. And then these are again enlarged and enlarged, and then you will find another reason why they should remain in there for a longer time. So it's, yeah, it, that's why we're fighting this now and hoping to, to change the future. How do you see your chances, uh, actually, uh, on long term or short term, the chances to get to we, that we, point to stop? We are very convinced that we yeah. will be successful. Because otherwise, we wouldn't have started this. This is one of our principles. We only do things that we are convinced of um, being able to win. And we think that we will win this. And what will come out of it, referring to, the, I think, the, the, second, the second question earlier, um, what will be happening in the future with other de leg legislation, I can't know. But one argument the police is always making, or in private at least to me, are 
is that they're saying, well, people will get used to it and it won't be in, in five or ten years, nobody's going to uh, be wondering about things like this. And this is exactly what we are working against, that this never becomes normal. Because if this becomes normal, as I've argued yes. before... It needs an applause, yes. If it becomes normal, as I've argued before, it is easy to extend it to all sorts of life, uh, ways of life and uh, walks of life, and uh, this then would be in a surveillance state um, par excellence. Very, we are very close there, so we need to support them really hard. There is one last question I suggest. Uh, no, there is two questions. Number two. Yes. Um, does the PNR directive apply only for regular scheduled flights, or does it also apply for private flights, uh, general aviation, business flights, etc.? Good question. I don't know, actually. I'll look into that. And uh, write me. Uh, come come uh, here later, and I'll check and give you an answer. Then there is one at number one. Uh, I just wanted to uh, ask a question in response to the idea that this is becoming very normal. Um, because one thing that uh, I think has become very normal that hasn't been mentioned explicitly is the idea that uh, people can be uh, essentially put on a watch list as being a potential criminal in the absence of a crime. You know, and we have these terrorist watch lists all over the world now. Um, yeah, that is now the new normal, and I think that's very problematic. And can you just maybe talk about, do, we, do you see a future where we can actually get back to you know, only arresting or investigating people because of probable cause, for example? Oh, I hope um, that this will be our future. But uh, about that point, that very point, I'm not too optimistic, to be honest. I'm optimistic about one other, one, another thing that is that these instruments that are now being created will prove to be highly ineffective. As we've so now, seen now already with the checking against databases, that is already a lot of work and very tedious work. But with the idea that you can uh, define criteria for people that, um, that are legitimately to be suspected of uh, committing a crime in the future, I think it will prove at least for the next few decades to be quite impossible. And this is, uh, I don't know if this came across uh, correct, uh, uh, sufficiently, but this is really the the core issue that we have with the PNR directive, they are claiming that they can find suspects of crimes, of future crimes, imagine. Not, not someone that has committed a crime or that will definitely commit a crime, but that can reason, reasonably be suspected of committing a crime in the future and then act upon that. And that is really a, a huge step into um, yeah, what I called voodoo uh, about the, the expectation that you can take data and, and, and prevent crime, a minority report times uh, yeah, to the power of five. I don't know. Uh, sit back and relax. Thank you, Bijan. And thank you, Walter, for this fantastic uh, lecture. Please support them at nopnr.eu. Go to their booth as well. And thank you all.